Welcome everyone, my name is Joan Kerber Walker and on behalf of AZ Bio, I'd like to welcome you to the Arizona launch of the, Na the NAM Pharma Manufacturing Report. Now, for those of you that don't know what NAM is, it's the National Association of Manufacturers and we are thrilled to have them with us partnering on this event today, as well as our friends at the Arizona Chamber of Commerce and Industry. So um, with that, I've been chartered with doing a quick introduction, sharing a couple of fun facts, and then passing it over to our great speakers. Um, and so when we think about manufacturing, we think of factories. We think of great big machines, you know, making new products and services that are going to help us in our daily lives. Well, when it comes to the biomedical and biomanufacturing area, we really do make an impact on people's lives because the products that we manufacture are literally going to improve the quality of life, extend the quality of life, and in many cases, save lives. So um, one, my fun fact to share with you is we just wrapped up in the first week of October, Arizona Bioscience Week. And for those of you that didn't get to join us then, it is on the AZ Bio website. Many of the videos are there, but here's a few things that happened. We kicked things off on Sunday with Celebrating Life in Science, a special television broadcast on ABC that aired twice during Arizona Bioscience Week so that all of the people across Arizona have an idea and can see the amazing work that our bioscience industry is doing right here in our state. That was followed up with a look to the future where the University of Arizona hosted the Discovering New Medicines in Arizona Com Conference. And we heard from some of the leading researchers in the state on what they see as the new cures that are being discovered at our universities. That was followed up with the AZ Advances Innovation Showcase, where our young early stage companies, 12 of them, got to tell their story in a rapid fire pitch, and then the investors gave them feedback. And then um, not at all towards the end of the week, but very, very important, was Voice of the Patient. This was an event where the patients in our community told industry what's important to them and industry sat and listened. And then a little bit of fun at the end, the Road to 50 States, which is highlighting the cool pharma research and manufacturing that's happening in every state in the country, came to 850 PBC on the Phoenix Biomedical Campus and met with some of our exciting companies. And you'll hear a little bit about them a little later in the program. But that's what we're doing. Um, don't forget, Put your questions in the chat. And with that, I'd like to hand off to my good friend, Garrick Taylor at the Arizona Chamber of Commerce and Industry, who's going to tell us a little bit about Arizona Manufacturing Month. Thanks, Joan. And on behalf of the chamber and job creators across the state, we appreciate the invitation. Now, some of you might know that the chamber is the home of something called the Arizona Manufacturers Council. This is a, a board within a board, if you will, of manufacturers, large and small, in all sorts of different sectors, including the sector that Joan represents and in, in her organization. We're always pleased to partner with Joan and uh, bio industry on events like these. Should also note that October is Manufacturing Month, and you can't think of a better time to have this conversation than today. Uh, earlier this month, the Arizona Manufacturers Council. Uh, hosted its annual Manufacturer of the Year Awards and Summit, where we recognize the innovators, uh, small businesses to the Fortune 500, who improve Arizona's quality of life and create jobs. And it, we should note, as Joan mentioned, that it's her members that are improving uh, the lives of Arizonans every day and in many ways saving lives. Yesterday, in fact, we also did our uh, uh, manufacturing Month Made in Arizona Tour. Every year we tour manufacturers across the state this year, no different, where we were visiting a uh, foundry that makes parts for golf clubs, uh, a uh, defense contractor that makes body armor, 
for men and women in uniform and a silicon wafer plant that is serving major suppliers like Intel and TSMC. And then we wrapped up the day with a visit to uh, one of Arizona's own uh, woman-owned microbreweries. So you name it, from uh, food and beverage to advanced manufacturing parts and electric vehicles, Arizona does it all. Now, we're fortunate to have an environment that's so receptive to manufacturing because of the contributions of our governor and our legislature that every day are working to advance uh, pro-business policies that attract manufacturers to Arizona. We, as you know, have become a major location for businesses looking to scale and expand. And Arizona right now has one of the hottest job markets, thanks in no small part to manufacturing. Historic investments in Arizona, like Intel's recent announcement that it will be investing $20 billion at a Chandler facility are just a sign of things to come, we hope. Uh, TSMC, they've announced plans to build a $12 billion plant in Phoenix. Their expansions over the next three years should total somewhere in the range of $100 billion. I already mentioned the Intel investment, but that in addition to setting up a new fab is gonna lead to 3,000 new high-tech, high-wage jobs, 3,000 construction jobs, and more than 15,000 indirect jobs that will be created as a result of the expansion. Now look, those are big headline investments when, you have, when you're talking companies like Intel and TSMC. But if you talk to our friends in the uh, economic development community at the Arizona Commerce Authority, at GPAC and other groups, the pipeline is full. It's very robust and we're very encouraged about the years ahead uh, for Arizona's manufacturing um, uh, sector. Now, why is this so important to talk about manufacturing? Well, one manufacturing job in Arizona supports an average of 1.4 additional jobs. So that means if the manufacturing sector is growing, it's a good indicator that the overall economy is healthy and strong. Right now, our state has approximately 177,000 men and women employed in the manufacturing industry, and they're earning an average wage of $88,000 a year. That's nearly twice the average annual wage earned by their counterparts in the private sector. Now, remember, we were once heavily reliant on real estate, and there's nothing wrong with real estate and construction jobs. It's a core component of our economy. But right now, Arizona boasts more manufacturing jobs than construction jobs. It's a sign of a healthy economy and a varied one, making us less susceptible to wild swings in, in the market. Now, uh, one of the things that our friends at the National Association of Manufacturers do is they work to fight against burdensome state and federal regulations that stymie the growth of Arizona and national manufacturers. And we appreciate the NAM's work to make Arizona and our, the rest of our states competitive and attractive to manufacturing. Uh, years of pro-growth leadership from groups like the NAM and at our legislature and across uh, numerous gubernatorial administrations have fostered a friendly economy that welcomes entrepreneurship, job creation, and technological modernization. Now, I mentioned at the outset of this conversation that we are the home at the Arizona Chamber of the Arizona Manufacturers Council. The Arizona Manufacturers Council is a state affiliate to the National Association of Manufacturers, uh, one of the foremost and most prominent advocates for the manufacturing sector in this country. Uh, their work on behalf of manufacturers, it's absolutely indispensable. So I know we look forward to hearing from Sean and his remarks, but I hope I've given you a sense of just how important the manufacturing sector is for the nearly 200,000 Arizonans employed in that sector and the jobs that that sector creates. Joan, thanks for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Garrick. And um, we are truly appreciative of the Arizona Chamber. And um, we could not do everything that we do without your partnership and support. And we are truly, truly grateful. So thank you so much for that update. Great job. So now I want to pass the, the microphone over to Sean Dubravic. And Sean, um, is the study author of the report we're going to be talking about. So we're going to the source. Um, Sean, it's all yours. 
Uh, thank you. It's great to be here with you today virtually. Uh, as Joan mentioned, uh, my remarks really are based on the study that NAM published called in Ensuring a Healthy Future. So, uh, you know, the old adage is true. The book is better than the movie. I encourage you to, uh, to read the full study and take a look. I'm going to highlight to, to kick us off just five key points from the study. And, and many of them really build on what Garrick was saying. Uh, manufacturing is a uh, multiplier industry. So it's producing not only jobs within the industry, but also jobs outside of the industry and, and spills over into the broader economy. And that's definitely true when it comes to the pharmaceutical industry. So point, point number one is just that the uh, productivity of the pharmaceutical industry and, and of its employees is tremendous. On average, across the country, each employee produces about $1.3 million worth of, of product in a, in a given year. That compares to about $188,000 for uh, kind of the, the, the broader view. So uh, the pharmaceutical industry on a per employee basis is producing about three times as much as we, we see from, uh, uh, from broader output and employees. So you have a very productive workforce. Uh, the industry produces a tremendous number of STEM jobs. That would be my second point. So on average in the country, about 6.7% of our occupations are, are STEM related jobs. In the pharmaceutical industry, it's close to 30% of jobs are, are STEM occupations. So uh, there's a tremendous amount of spillover that happens there as well. If you actually talk to pharmaceutical manufacturers, you'll see that they are extremely active in their communities, not, not only from a, a social responsibility standpoint, but also building the curriculum and helping community colleges and, and local colleges and universities build the curriculum that they need to help uh, usher in the employees that that will drive the future and so you you see them uh, contributing not only to their own organizations and creating stem jobs within their own organizations but creating stem opportunities far beyond the the confines of their their own uh, buildings uh, point number three that i would make is that not only are the workers extremely productive but they're also extremely well compensated the average annual labor uh, income per worker in the pharmaceutical industry is about $172,000. So that compares extremely well to other, what, what we would historically consider high paying industries like finance and insurance, uh, which averages about $90,000, uh, professional, scientific, and, and technical services, which averages about $133,000 per employee. So, you have an industry in pharmaceutical that is both extremely productive and also the ability to, uh, to reward those employees and to compensate them. Um, it's about 2.7 times the US workforce average. So again, a very well compensated workforce. And as Garrick alluded to, there's a lot of spillover that happens when you have a, an industry like that in your community. Uh, they, they support a lot of things. That would be my, my fourth point, is that there are a lot of spillovers when it comes to the pharmaceutical industry. Every job in the pharmaceutical industry supports about six jobs outside of the pharmaceutical industry. That's a, a very big multiplier when you're looking at what a, an industry is able to contribute to its local economy. Uh, for every dollar earned by an employee in the pharmaceutical industry, about $2.40, a little, little over $2.40, is earned by employees outside of the industry. So it's really important to think about those spillover effects. And, and Garrett talked about them broadly from a manufacturing perspective. Uh, it's clear that pharmaceutical industry and pharmaceutical manufacturing is really helping lead that way. Uh, the, the industry in, uh, across the nation produces about $340 billion in, in output. But again, there's a, a, a broad spillover effect there. So for every dollar that the industry is producing, they're also helping about a dollar and nine, a dollar and nine cents be produced outside of the industry. So again, you see that, that multiplier. 
And my uh, fifth and final point that I would make is that to have all of this, to have a rich pharmaceutical industry and a rich pharmaceutical ecosystem, you really need strong private investment. And the, the pharmaceutical industry reinvests in itself uh, al almost compared to no other industry. Uh, they put back over 11% of their sales into R&D. Uh, so that is a, a tremendous amount that they are reinvesting into those life-saving drugs and, and life-changing medicines that uh, will ensure a strong pipeline, not only for the, their own success, but also for our broader health. Um, the, to kind of put that into perspective, 11.4% of, of sales going to R&D is about three times more than the uh, average R&D investment for manufacturers more broadly. So uh, compared to every other industry, pretty much they are pouring back their revenue into R&D and into an investment. So let me uh, stop there. I, again, I'd encourage you to go to the NAM website, check out the, the full research where you can read more about these, these findings. And I, I look forward to continuing the conversation. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sean. And um, for our listeners um, who are with us live, you will find the link to the report in the chat. Um, and for those of you that will be joining us via video at a later date, um, we will have the link on the website with the video. So with that, I've been asked to take you down to the ground level. So um, you know, we heard from Garrick who gave you the overview of how important manufacturing is in Arizona and Sean with the great data on what's going on in the state. So now I wanna give you kind of a, a from the ground view of what it's like in Arizona. So when we look at Arizona's um, bio industry and we tend to, to focus across the industry sector and across the state, um, there are over 1,400 companies that now employ almost 30,000 people um, that are specifically working in this. And that's not the hospitals or the broader healthcare sector. When you add them all up, it's over 300,000 people all working to make life better for the people in Arizona and to keep us healthy and help us when we're sick. So um, as we started to look at that, we started to look at the numbers. And one of the really exciting numbers is Arizona's growth as an industry. We've grown 44% in our biomanufacturing sector over the last couple of years. That's seven times the national average. So we may be small, but we're mighty and we're coming up fast. Um, and the way that that's happening is that small companies are doing the research and development that are going to become manufacturing companies that will then not only impact people in Arizona with great jobs and you know, giving back to our tax base, but also make life better for people all over the world. Now, one great success story is one that took, you know, it was an overnight success that was 30 years in the making, um, was Ventana Medicine. Ventana Medical um, was founded by Tom Grogan. He was a doctor who saw a problem that needed to be fixed. And he worked and worked and worked and chased the investors and built his team in Tucson, Arizona. And then the company was acquired by one of the largest um, life science companies in the world, Roche. And today, Roche Tissue Diagnostics is headquartered in Oro Valley, a suburb of Tucson. And um, we now have over 750 employees in that facility manufacturing the life-changing um, diagnostics that are companion therapeutics to life-changing drugs. So those stories are really important. And by the way, they haven't stopped in working on innovations. They're still doing investments in R&D every single day and announcing new products on a regular basis. The other thing is those small biotechs, we have so many of them in Arizona. And some of the really exciting ones, you know, we hear a lot about cancer and Oncomix Therapeutics is working on a therapeutic 
based on a virus that is not good for rabbits, but can really help people. And the idea is that that could be a new immunotherapy that could provide answers to people dealing with those kinds of cancers. But what if there was a way to eradicate cancer completely? That's what Calvary is working on. They're actually working on a multi-cancer diagnostic and developing hopefully a vaccine that could prevent cancer in the first place. And it's not just all about cancer. Aqua lung therapeutics down in Tucson, they've been developing a new medicine that will help people who are having difficulty breathing um, when they have diseases like COVID or have problems with their heart or lungs for, from other diseases. We also have um, Nuvox Therapeutics. Now, did you know that more people die from heart attack and stroke than any other disease? Well, that's where Nuvox is coming in and they're working on a new therapeutic for stroke patients. And then unique to Arizona, we have Valley Fever Solutions because Arizona is ground zero for Valley Fever. And we need new medicines that can help people that are affected by that. And did you know there hasn't been a new medicine in 30 years? That's why so much research and development is going into these companies so that then they can get approved through the regulatory process and start manufacturing here in Arizona to grow our sector even more. So what's the impact? You know, how does that all play out? Well, I've got some numbers for you because as my AZ Bio members know, I like numbers. So economic impact. The last time that we were able to calculate that was based on 2018 numbers. We'll have new numbers based on 2020 next year. So the economic impact in 2018 from our industry was $32.67 billion. Now, that sounds like a lot of money, and it is, especially when we've invested as a state $23 billion in building up our research universities, our hospitals, our institutes like TGen, and our companies over the last 20 years. So 23 years of investment at 20, or $23 billion in investment over 20 years yielded in 2018 $32.6 in just one year. That's a return on investment. And in addition to that, we're still struggling with venture capital, and that number could be so much bigger. I can tell you that um, our neighbors in Colorado, they have three times the venture capital that we do, and their GDP, is, their economic impact is a lot higher too. And little Utah, they're beating us on venture capital and economic impact. And we just can't have that. So we all need to work together to make that better. Now, the other thing that I wanted to make sure that I clarified, and this was something that Sean talked about in the national numbers. And that is that the average wage is 172,000. And it is for the, the biopharmaceutical industry. But one of the reasons for that is that there's such a large concentration of biomanufacturing in states like California, Massachusetts, New Jersey. Those are expensive places to make things. And when companies look at Arizona for their manufacturing, what they'll find is that the total cost of operations, including people, is about 30% less. So when we talk to manufacturers who are looking at Arizona, either to come here or to grow here, that makes a huge difference because every dollar you spend, you can put back into R&D so that you can have new treatments and new cures coming down the pipeline in the future. So that's kind of my wrap up of some of the things that you're seeing in Arizona. Um, and by the way, AZ Bio is working on access to capital. We are currently working with the support of the US Department of Commerce and the EDA on developing AZ Advances, which will be a endowment-based seed fund 
that will provide early stage life science investment in Arizona forever. And when we get that done, we will have a new catalyst that will move us forward even faster than we're moving forward right now. So with that, I am going to open it back up to our panel. And I want to remind all of our attendees that the chat is open. Do not leave me with no questions or I'll come after you later. I have your email addresses. All right. So let's start off. And um, Garrick, since we um, you know, kicked off together, um, when you look at you know, the, the local businesses and associations that are working together to drive this economic success, you know, how critical is it that they be involved, be engaged in these discussions? Oh, it's essential, Joan. Uh, collaboration across industry groups and business groups is, is essential. Um, you know, look, the, the Chamber of Commerce, we're a fairly vocal advocate on behalf of the business community. But industry groups like yours, you know your members better than anyone. And so when you get a, a red alert from the NAM or from your national bio industry groups, or in, in the case sometimes that I get from the U.S. Chamber, uh, you need uh, local business groups to respond. You know, part of what we're discussing here today, uh, we hope that this just doesn't, you're not hitting the record button and then it just is going to sit on the shelf. This information we hope you'll share with your elected officials and uh, individuals of influence who can help shape policy and ensure that the U.S. and Arizona remains an attractive place for uh, investment in manufacturing and uh, the uh, bioscience manufacturing. So, Joan, that, that type of collaboration across associations and groups, it's, it's essential. Garrick, and um, Sean, when we look from the national stage, especially you know, with everything that's going on um, at the nation's capital around infrastructure or manufacturing, the importance of growing these jobs, what do you see as, as the key drivers and some of the things that people might want to be engaging with their elected leaders or their ex the executive branch on? So it's, it's important to remember and to recognize that while the industry is robust and dynamic, it is also delicate and fragile. And uh, it requires nurturing, it requires investment. Uh, all you have to do is look at countries that uh, inhibited their pharmaceutical industry and they lost their pharmaceutical industry. Just take a look at Canada and, and we, talk a little bit about the Canada experience in the, in the research, uh, they put in policies that ultimately inhibited innovation and th those manufacturers went elsewhere. It is a, a globally competitive environment. Uh, we were already in an environment where we were seeing some consolidation in, uh, in the industry and, and other industries. And so that they went elsewhere. And so, when you look at their experience with COVID, they weren't able to produce any of the vaccines in country. They didn't have the equipment to do so. So they ended up importing vaccines from places like Belgium that had the, the infrastructure and the capacity to produce these life-saving vaccines. So when you look at the US industry, it's important to recognize that it is competitive and, and competing against countries around the world uh, to, to uh, be a place where manufacturing can thrive. And likewise, if you're Arizona and you're looking at what's happening at a state level, they too are competing against other states to create a, an environment that is conducive to manufacturers. And there's a lot of things that, uh, that facilitate that. I talked a little bit about that you know, robust and dynamic ecosystem. You look at a lot of the, the manufacturers and they are partnering with their local universities, their local schools to help uh, create a, a pathway for those students to come right into the workforce and to be able to contribute on day one. And so there's a lot of a partnering that takes place, a lot of interactions that, that take place. Policymakers need to recognize these dynamics. They need to recognize that it, it isn't just uh, you know, doing what, what may feel like the best for your jurisdiction, but that you're competing against, uh, 
every country and, and every state and every territory or jurisdiction that's trying to attract these high, high paying, high productive, high performance jobs. And so they, they need to take that into account and they need to take into account the ecosystem too, that they need to build out that infrastructure that is conducive. And in many ways, we have a lot of that, uh, those pieces in place already. So you think about the, the stable, uh, you know, electricity and, and stable infrastructure that we need. Uh, states are doing a good job at producing those type of, uh, of uh, items for manufacturing and specifically for pharmaceutical manufacturing. But that ecosystem is, is broader and policymakers need to take that into account. Joan, uh, just to echo what Sean said, you know, when groups like ours are talking about um, public policy that we are trying to uh, put into practice, it's just, it's not a theoretical, it's not an esoteric thing. As Sean just said, if you look at the example of Canada and its pharmaceutical industry, that's a cautionary tale. You know, prior to 2017, something we heard a lot in this economy was this idea of inversions. That's when a US-based company would organize itself from a corporation standpoint overseas because it offered perhaps a more attractive tax and regulatory environment. Now, uh, on the other side of the passage of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017, we've seen much less of that. And so when there is a bill that's being debated in Congress that would dramatically change um, tax rates in this country, uh, we're not just uh, belly aching about having to pay more. We are really worried about an erosion of uh, entire industries in this country, which as Sean said, you might not get back. Thanks, Garrick. And so Sean, um, let's kind of do what we did, you know, national, local, state, and then, you know, on the ground. So Sean, um, what do you see as what it's going to take to keep the United States competitive in the biopharmaceutical sector? Yeah, certainly some of those policies are already in place. Uh, the United States really does lead, uh, lead the world when it comes to things like intellectual property protection. And that is uh, key when it comes to pharmaceutical manufacturing, as, as you would probably guess. So those type of policies are extremely important to uh, attracting companies in areas like pharmaceutical manufacturing. The, the rule of law becomes very important is, and is a um, important incentive for those companies. But it can't just end there with uh, protecting that intellectual property and, and Garrett hit upon it. If you start to put in inhibitors towards the you know, manufacturers, whether you're doing it at the national level or, or the, uh, you know, the state level, the local level, uh, it will persuade companies to look for greener pastures, it, they will move. And when you think of a, a global market like pharmaceuticals, they'll move to where the, those policies are most conducive for production, yeah, even if they are selling those pharmaceuticals uh, across the globe. Uh, when it comes to production, they do have some choice and they, they will make a choice. And it, again, if you kind of look at Canada, um, their inhibitors actually caused some manufacturers to not even sell the drugs in the, in the country. And so um, there, there are a lot of things that we are doing right today. And I think we need to, to continue to do those things because as Garrett mentioned, if you impose policies and, and you put these things in place, you'll lose industries uh, entirely. And it is very difficult to bring them back because they start to build out those ecosystems that I talked about. They start to build out the infrastructure. And so once all of that infrastructure is in place, once those relationships with, uh, you know, with universities and colleges are in place and they're, they're embedded in the community, uh, then it is hard to, to pull them away from that if they're, if they're in an environment that is conducive for manufacturing. Eric, when you look at across Arizona and across the manufacturing sectors, mm -hmm. what the Arizona Chamber, you know, has so, hears so many voices. What are the big messages that our elected leaders need to be listening to? Well, 
you know, the more you listen to groups like uh, the NAM and the Bio Industry Association, the better, we would say that's going to lead to a more competitive economy. There are certain legs of the stool, Joan, that uh, we stress with policymakers, taxes, regulations, legal, labor, and education. And for the, the issues we're talking about today, especially higher education, making sure that you build out that, uh, that ecosystem as as well. Um, Arizona fares uh, quite well in this space. We have a low uh, corporate tax rate. Oh, the legislature earlier this year and Governor Ducey signed uh, the implementation of a phase down uh, individual income tax. Eventually will be a flat tax. I understand it's under litigation right now, but we're hoping for a favorable outcome there. Uh, Arizona has a very favorable labor environment. We're a right to work state. Uh, those issues though, taxes and labor, which I just discussed, those could be undermined uh, on, depending on how certain legislation turns out at a federal level. There's legislation on Capitol Hill right now that could eliminate the right to work status of dozens of states across the country, including Arizona. There's legislation, as you know, that could dramatically increase the corporate uh, tax rate that could create a very high combined rate uh, when you consider your state rate. But also, and this uh, to echo something Sean said, it would just make the U.S. less competitive overall. Uh, we are not um, building uh, widgets in a vacuum here. These are, uh, these are global jobs. Other countries are competing for job creators, and we would hate to uh, do real damage to our tax code that uh, push job creators away rather than bringing them here. Now, there are other elements that I discussed. I will mention that when it comes to manufacturing broadly, our proximity to Mexico as a border state is an asset. Uh, we have integrated supply chains. As you know, in Pinal County, we have a burgeoning electric car industry. One of the reasons is because of our proximity to bring uh, parts in from Mexico and rely on the twin plant operations there. So that's another advantage that a lot of states simply don't have. There are only four uh, border states with Mexico. We're very fortunate to be one of them. Thanks. I, I would just echo one point, uh, you know, as it relates to the pharmaceutical industry specifically, when you look at the multiplier effects that the industry brings, it, it, it isn't that you would just lose the pharmaceutical industry. And I think that's a, a mistake that policymakers can easily make is they see, you know, a, an industry that is highly productive, that has high production but maybe in certain areas doesn't have a, a high job count. Uh, and they fail to recognize the large number of jobs that are created outside of that, uh, that industry. So if you cr pass policies that inhibit innovation and that uh, cause pharmaceutical manufacturers to look elsewhere, not only do they take their jobs with them, but they also end up supporting a, a much broader base of jobs that will follow as well. Thanks, Sean. And you know, when we look at, um, and I'm, I'm watching the chat, so please, um, attendees, remember to put your questions in the chat. Um, one of the questions was, you know, how many pharmaceutical manufacturers do we have here in Arizona? And the answer is, um, we have a couple, not a lot. Um, so, so message, message to um, <laughs> the people watching online. There's lots of room to grow here. Um, but we have companies, and interestingly, these are companies that grew up here. So, you know, West Pharmaceuticals, which is a key biopharmaceutical supplier, um, you know, is, is based in the greater Phoenix area, as is um, BMS, Bristol Myers Squibb. Now, interestingly, in the case of that company, um, it started as a little company that was doing R&D, it developed into a larger company, got acquired by a big company, and that company got acquired by a bigger company. And that manufacturing facility has expanded three times since I've been here. Um, so it's, you know, it's a real story of success. Um, the other thing that, you know, was brought up, and it's really important, is the supply chain. Because you know, as we've seen in other industries that are literally crippled right now 
because of supply chain problems. Um, you know, in the biopharmaceutical industry, there was tremendous collaboration to bring forward the R&D and then the manufacturing and the delivery of the products that we've needed locally, nationally, and globally during the pandemic. And a key part of that is the way the biomanufacturing and the biopharmaceutical salute community was able to collaborate on those supply chain challenges. Um, whether it was sharing resources, um, you know, moving materials back and forth, um, sharing, um, for instance, cold chain. We did not even have in this country enough cold chain storage and logistics to move everything around. And, um, you know, a great example um, is Langham Logistics, which is a logistics company specifically focused on um, the biopharmaceutical space um, that's based in Indiana. And they came here to Arizona and built a new facility to help us manage the biopharmaceutical supply chain and are now growing here with us. So um, you, you have to look at it from that perspective. The other thing is that the life-changing um, medicines, treatments, therapies that come out of this industry, they don't work in isolation. It is a very interconnected industry. So a great example, um, two um, biomanufacturing companies that we have here in Arizona, Dexcom, who uh, moved their manufacturing to Arizona from California, shows that they have smart management, as well as Medtronic, who's been growing here in Arizona for 30 years. And what was once one little tiny um, fab is now a 10 building campus in Tempe. And the products that they make, especially for our diabetes patients, those are integrated products. So basically you have the medical device that is measuring how the patient is doing and then helping to dispense the medicine to the patient. We see the same thing in our partners with Becton Dickinson or BD. Their headquarters for peripheral intervention is here in Tempe, on Tempe Town Lake. And so they make the devices, the catheters, the ports that are used to move these medicines through the patient's treatment process so that they can get better. Because a vial of medicine doesn't do the patient any good until we get it in them. And so as we look at that, you know, that's really important. And it was so exciting um, to see this year um, that Dexcom got some real recognition. Garrick, you want to talk about that? Yeah, I mean, I didn't anticipate this. Dexcom was the Arizona Manufacturers Council large manufacturer of the year. This, they're making life-changing, life-saving technology for diabetic patients. And uh, again, Joan, the things we're talking about here, they're just not theoretical. We are seeing real investment in this state that changes lives. And by pursuing policies of the track companies like Dexcom, uh, Arizona can continue to be a hub for that sort of innovation. And Joan, wasn't Dexcom uh, a location for a mass vaccination site as well? It sure was. So, you know, Dexcom opened their first facility. They had, um, you know, hired a lot of people. They had brought it online, but they had also created expansion manufacturing capacity that they were going to grow into. And they didn't need it when we needed it. So for those of you that don't live in Arizona, it gets hot here in the summer. And so our outside vaccination sites, when we were doing these mass vaccinations to get everybody going and testing too, um, it, was, it was really tough when people had to sit in the hot sun or you know, be the people working in the hot sun while people sat in their cars to get their, their test or their vaccine. And so um, the team at Dexcom opened that excess capacity that was beautiful, clean, ready to go and it became a healthcare delivery site. And we are incredibly grateful to them for doing that. Sean, you got to see, you know, a lot of the things that are going on across the country. Um, when you look at, you know, 
how we stay competitive, right? It's talent, it's infrastructure, right? We have to be able to deliver stuff. We have to be able to make stuff. Um, what are some of the things that are being discussed in the infrastructure package that can help manufacturing and the industry? Well, I think, uh, Joan, just to, to kind of hit on your point more broadly, uh, you're exactly right. I mean, there are things that uh, we can do to facilitate uh, industry. And we've been talking a little bit about some of the, the, the policies that inhibit industry. But uh, to your point, building out that infrastructure, uh, ensuring, um, you know, again, kind of rule of law, strong IP protection, all, all of these things really facilitate uh, transaction. And then, uh, as you also noted, it's building out that, that pipeline for talent. So uh, pharmaceutical manufacturers are always partnering with, uh, with local, as I mentioned already, local universities, community colleges to help build and, and train the workforce that they uh, look to hire. And so, uh, you know, policies that at the local level that help um, build out those type of, of uh, areas and arenas are, I think are quite conducive to building an environment that attracts pharmaceuticals. And, and when I look at Arizona from afar, you see uh, a, you know, a great uh, group of uh, universities and colleges that uh, attract students from around the globe. And that's a, a great environment when you're looking to, uh, to create you know, a pharmaceutical uh, ecosystem and, and to leverage all of that talent. Yeah, Joan, and you think about that infrastructure bill, you know, no state wants to get a reputation for uh, supply chain congestion and bottlenecks. And so just basic brick and mortar investment to ensure that our hubs of innovation can get their products to market uh, more quickly, that's a win for the state and a win for job creators. All that stuff that's on trucks and knock wood when the supply chain um, a bottleneck at our ports is uh, unclogged, uh, that stuff on those trucks, it doesn't ride for free. And so markets that get a reputation for congestion uh, become uh, less attractive to overall investment. I'll say something else, and Joan, I, I won't promise anybody on this call that uh, parts of rural Arizona are going to become hubs of uh, bioscience, uh, research, and engineering. However, without greater investment in broadband internet, then it's going to be very hard for rural Arizona to play a part in the Arizona economy that we know it's capable of. It won't be able to reach its full economic potential. And so that's a very positive element as well. You've already seen some coverage on uh, investment happening in, along Interstate 40 and Interstate 17 to make those areas uh, more connected to high-speed internet. Now, that's the brick and mortar bipartisan infrastructure, infrastructure bill that uh, attracted votes from both Republicans and Democrats in the Senate. As good as that is, uh, the reconciliation bill that's being debated in the House is uh, just as concerning uh, for job creators. So we would hope that lawmakers would take the win and pass the bill that has the good stuff that we just discussed. I, I, building off of that, Garrick, I think the other important thing to recognize is we aren't just building for today's industry, but we need to also think about building for tomorrow's industry. So you, you talk about a you know, digitally connected, uh, always on capabilities, that's going to be extremely important when we start to usher in the factories of the future that will rely on uh, a great swaths of, of digitization and what I, what I talk about moving from digitization to datafication. And they're going to need that uh, connectivity in lots of places that they're not utilizing it today. So uh, it's important when we look at these bills and when we look at policies to think not just about today's current industry, but also the industries that we want to usher into the future. It's a great point. Yep. Thank you. And, um, you know, I think, you know, just to, to touch on, on broadband and access. So as we look across um, Arizona's bioscience sector, which includes diagnostics, medicines, medical devices, and health IT, you know, what we've learned during the pandemic is that in many cases we can deliver quality care 
if we have the ability for the people in those more remote communities to access it. What we've learned is that for our students, um, there are tremendous capacities for learning and sharing resources that we can utilize online if they have the broadband access to take advantage of them that our students have in the urban course. And so, you know, Garrick, I absolutely agree with you that that is a very, very important point, not just in Arizona, but across our country. The fact that there are parts of Mexico that have better broadband access than parts of the United States, that's just not acceptable. So, you know, that's an infrastructure we need to look at. I think we also have to um, really pay attention to the, um, our ability to be inclusive and bring in, you know, broader portions of our community to engage with us in research and development. And a key part of that is clinical trials because we can't make it until the FDA approves it. And so um, that is something where I would encourage every person in Arizona to talk to their doctors and to look at where there could be clinical trial opportunities. And what most people don't realize is you don't have to be sick to get in a clinical trial. As a matter of fact, I'm in a clinical trial right now. I am part of the Johnson & Johnson Ensemble 2 trial. So I was one of the people that they, that got two shots of Johnson & Johnson. I got one in January and one in March. And then they're tracking my health over a long period of time um, to see you know, how I'm doing. But I'm one of tens of thousands of people in that study that um, were one of the reasons that the FDA was able to give Johnson & Johnson an authoriz emergency use authorization just this week um, for people to get a second shot of J&J &J vaccine. So as we go through this process, we need to remember that the, the funds that are coming from the biopharmaceutical industry are then reinvested in a very, very complex research and development process to get us to that stage. And if you're Johnson & Johnson, the biggest healthcare company in the world, you can afford to do that. If you're Pfizer, you can afford to fund the entire R&D of the COVID vaccine, the first one ever in the world, out of your own pocket. And that's what they did. They didn't take a dollar of federal money to develop that vaccine. They did it on their own. So when you look at that, those giant companies that we say, oh, well, you know, they're, they're just taking advantage of everybody. No, they're reinvesting in the things we're going to need for today and in the future. But the other thing we have to think about with the policies that are happening right now, and is it, I was in the national press this week um, based on, you know, conversations that we've had with our le elected leaders, not during this pricing discussion, but for a decade, talking about how critically important it is that we have access to capital so that our early stage innovating companies in Arizona can get to the stage where they are manufacturers. And that's where we rely on friends and family, angel investors, private foundations, and venture capitalists to get them to that stage. And so there is no industry that I know of, and I have worked in technology for over four decades, and only one decade was in the biosciences. There is no industry that I know of that is harder or riskier than bringing a biopharmaceutical to market. The level of risk is not often commensurate with the level of reward. And that's the calculation that an investor looks at. So if we make it harder for investors to look to a very far horizon and try and determine if their investment is going to pay off or not, 
and we put doubt in their minds, then they're less likely to invest in the very, 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 very risky little company who's trying to bring a new treatment or cure to market. And those things that they're working on, I'm the mother of, of a, a patient that has severe Crohn's disease. Biopharmaceuticals is letting my son live a normal life. They're expensive. But living life in a colostomy bag or spending weeks in the hospital is more expensive. So we have to look at the total cost of treating patients as we have these discussions. We also need to stop looking at one piece of the sector and saying, well, we're just going to, you know, tweak the taxes on the manufacturing community, or we're going to make it harder to import the raw materials they need with tariffs, or we're going to take away their intellectual property protection in foreign countries. Those things create that increased level of risk that prevents the investors investing in these little companies that are going to create the things that are going to help you and me live longer and live better. And so when we have these discussions, we really have to look at how do we fix the value chain? How do we look at each component of how we get the products into the company, how we develop the products, how we get the products into manufacturing, how we get the manufactured products moving around the country, and most importantly, so that um, we have a system where the people that need them can get them when they need it. So with that, I'd like to, we're, we're at two minute warning here. So um, I'm gonna go to closing thoughts. Um, Garrick, you wanna go first? Thanks, Joan, and thanks for the opportunity to have this conversation today. Uh, you've heard what the chamber thinks about our manufacturing sector. We're very bullish on the growth that Arizona is likely to experience in the coming years. And part of that is because of the great advocacy of the uh, Arizona Bio Industry Association, National Association of Manufacturers. Our bio industry and pharmaceutical industry in this country is really a crown jewel. It is a success story that we should be touting. It is, um, makes uh, this country a global leader in an essential industry for improving uh, the quality of life for tens of thousands of individuals across the globe. This is something that we should cultivate here. We should take pride in it and we should promote public policy that encourages further growth of this sector. So uh, Joan, thanks to you and Sean for today's conversation. Sean? Yeah, I mean, I think that summed it up wonderfully. I would just add that there is tremendous opportunity and that this industry is interconnected into the, the fabric of our economy, both at a national level and at a local level. And so it's important to, to recognize uh, that the broad impact policymakers have when they start to uh, create a, an environment that is not conducive to innovation and to, uh, and to manufacturing. So uh, there is a tremendous opportunity here, I think, uh, both nationally and within Arizona to grow the pharmaceutical industry and as a direct result of that to grow the broader economy. And I wanna thank um, everyone for joining us today. I um, gotta to throw in a couple more of those numbers. Did you know that Arizona and Phoenix in particular has been recognized as a number five in the top emerging bioscience sectors in the country for merging. Now, I have a big job because my board of directors and AZ Bio members, our vision is that Arizona is going to become a top 10 bioscience state, not just emerging, in the top 10. And so to get there, we need to work in partnership with everybody that matters, right? Our elected leaders, and, and I see that, you know, as, as the call has been going on, um, some of the partners that we are, are deeply appreciative to um, in Washington, D.C. are here. I see that there's some um, representatives of our elected leaders 
um, offices are with us on the call. I'm not going to call out and embarrass anybody, but I, I'm very, very thankful to see representatives from both the House, friends from both the House and the Senate offices um, on the call today and our patient groups. Because you know what? This industry does not exist except to serve our patients. If we lose sight of that, if we lose sight of what they need, then we've lost our, our true north as an industry. And so as we continue to work together to discover, develop, manufacture, and deliver life-saving and life-changing innovations, it takes all of us work working together. And I am so thankful to everyone for joining us today. Um, we will have this video up if you missed parts of it um, by Monday. Um, and so thank you, be well, and let's go make something together. Bye-bye. <laughs>